our Highline Voices, 106.5 KQWZ LP FM. Connecting Highline and our region. Share your story. Our Highline Voices, history, cultural heritage, art, performances, contemporary, pop culture. We are very motivated to provide a vibrant community museum and authentic social gathering place. It truly takes a village to raise a museum. Despite the challenges, our daily inspiration is our eagerness to build a stronger and more connected community. This museum is from the community to the community. Our passion is for our visitors to have access to a broad spectrum of information sources and cultural perspectives. Our Highline Voices. Hi everyone, my name is Nancy, I'm the director of the Highline Heritage Museum and welcome back. Thank you so much for joining us today. Today we have um, Brian, who I'm going to let him introduce himself, but he is so cool. I cannot wait for you to kind of hear about who he is and the cool stories that he has to share. So I'm just really, really happy that, that he has the time and, and willingness to, to be with us today. Brian, I'm going to let you introduce yourself and... Once again, thank you so much for, for coming today with us, too. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Nancy. Yeah, I'm Ryan Burns, and I'm the owner of Berean School of Music, and I've been a Berean resident since um, the 80s, pretty much, and I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you. Um, music seems like there's one of the topics that kind of puts a mark on you. Like, I, I think of music, and right away, I'm connecting it with you. So... Tell us a little bit about your um, the connection with music and then your connection with the community. And then, uh, yeah, why? Why music? What is why it? For? Oh. Well, yeah, I just kind of realized from a young age that, um, you know, I, my, my grandma had a piano um, growing up. And so five years old, I was, she was showing me how to play Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, you know, picking it out. I can still hear her voice saying just one foggy G E G putting my fingers on the notes. And, um, <laughs> um, you know, from, uh, that was the start of it. And then just kind of, uh, into grade school, Pomeroy, Washington, really small town, Eastern Washington. Um, uh, they let you start instruments in the fifth grade. And, um, my best friend chose the saxophone. And so I, chose the saxophone as well <laughs> when we were sitting there picking instruments. And then the first day came and my best friend was in the trombone section. I was like, oh, he changed his mind. So um, from there, I I tried the saxophone, didn't work out, um, but it was just to be next to my friend anyway. So I just kind of kept switching instruments. And when I arrived in um, Burien, uh, well, I went to Mount Rainier High School first. Um, this would have been 86, I guess. And then uh, midway through, I transferred to Highline High School, stayed there the rest of the time, and uh, joined the jazz band there. By then, I had tried different instruments. So I, in the jazz band in at Highline, I played guitar one year, my sophomore year, bass junior year, bass guitar, and then piano my senior year. Um, and I've kind of kept up those three instruments all through life here. And now I teach all three, um, down there in Burien. Oh, that's amazing. Um, you know, I, I always think that when, when it comes to playing an instrument, there is either one instrument that, that calls you passion, one that just, you can stick with it. And then, and then, yes, you play with others, but there's one that just, you know, like you base your home base on, on how you express yourself. But hearing you and in, in how you, throughout the, the different phases in your life, you have been exposed to different ways of how you express that, whatever is inside of you through your music. So it is really cool to know that, that, that you can play that many instruments, and I don't know that many people who can do that. So that's really cool. Absolutely. And then, and then also the fact that you were, uh, you were in high school and uh, you participated in community events. Um, Tell me one thing about um, how do you feel when you play in the community? 
I mean, you know, like you have done some some performances here in Caroline, and do you feel like when it comes to music, do you feel that it's an expression of you? Or do you feel like this is like a party that you've been part of it and it's just everyone is sharing something? Or do you feel that it's just you and your own planet and it's just letting uh, go and having fun with it? <laughs> well, I don't know. I I personally, I just have a passion for music, um, which is something that you can't teach, really. <laughs> you can inspire <laughs> others, but um, somehow I just inherently have that um, and the need to want to share that with other people. So, um, you know, I just it just felt very organic for me to perform, um, to be on stage. Um, I never really got the stage fright sort of thing. I feel almost more comfortable uh, playing music than in regular life. <laughs> Doing Zoom, Zoom interviews, for example, no. <laughs> but, uh, you know, but back to those high school days, as the, those early days, the first, and involving the community, one of, one of my first biggest moments was being able to perform at the Burien Public Library with um, Percy Bronson, who was my, um, a lot of people, your listeners might know him that, that go that far back, but he, uh, um, he would play with his own band um, at the Burien Library once a year in the summer. And um, I was one of, I think, two students, uh, there's another student named Jim Pittman that he would invite. So it was a real honor to play with the play with the big boys and, you know, <laughs> as a teenager. And uh, that was a really good experience. Yeah, we um, even though I'm not from the area, I was not born and raised here. I have been working with the collections for a very long time here at the museum. So I recognize the name right away. I've seen oh, the photos. I've yeah. seen uh, now that there is as a collection of those photos in here. And, and yes, it is really cool. Like I said, I might know, you know, from the area, but I connect with that and I'm able to identify right away how, how cool that experience is for, for, yeah. for a young kid to actually play with him. So congratulations. Yeah. Everyone. And also, I mean, he, he would, uh, he would, anybody that wanted to stay after class, he would just stay with them and, and talk with them. And, um, he always, um, routinely, he would just stay after school and, come to my office and let's talk about, you know, what needs to happen with your life or it could be outside of music. And he was just really good with, with the kids. Wow. Well, that's so cool. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that experience. Now let's go into your professional life. I know okay. that you have a really, really cool stories and I'm going to just let you go with the. I'm just going to follow your pace, go with the flow, wherever you want to start. I know that, um, you and that you the last story that we're sharing is more about the local the local connections that you have but now it's about you and your passion and how that has been taking you through your journey up to today who okay. are you professionally uh today well I, I mean we could start today and go backwards i guess but um <laughs> well i mean um with the i guess just going through after high school, you know, I went to college, Green River Community College, and then also to Berkeley School of Music in Boston. Um, and then I came back to Seattle in 96 and kind of been here ever since. And so uh, most of my work started getting outside of, outside of, I, I really, very rarely had a gig in the Highline area, <laughs> but um, I started just kind of through jazz, I started to meet a lot of these uh, grunge rockers, like from Pearl Jam. And um, so I, like just this last weekend, I played a, a gig with Matt Cameron, who's from Soundgarden and Pearl Jam, the Matt Cameron trio. And um, that came, he called me back in 2004 to play at a jazz festival because he wanted to branch out and do this jazz thing. And so we did a little trio uh, recorded a CD and we played at the Bonnaroo Festival, which was kind of the the height of things there. And then Soundgarden got back together. Um, and um, we actually played at Bison Creek Pizza here in Burien was the last gig that we did. 
the, which is the grand opening for Berean School of Music in 2010. So we had gigged for about six years together, Matt Cameron. Through him, you know, I met Mike McCready, and he is the guitar player for Pearl Jam, and he's he got me playing um, his side project called Flight to Mars, which is at the show box um, once a year, usually, uh, Crohn's and Colitis benefit. And um, from him, you know, I, I met a lot of people too. And so it just kind of snowballed, I think, um, from there as far as, you know, the famous people you see on my bio, I kind of met through those two people primarily. Um, but uh, one that has a Berean connection that you might enjoy hearing about is um, uh, Ann Wilson of Heart. Um, I did a show with her at the show box uh, at one of these benefit shows with Mike McCready. And he asked me to play keyboards. Um, it was an opening set for our group. And I was very excited to play with Ann Wilson because I, you know, grew up listening to her. And um, there, Dempsey's hairstyling uh, and Seahurst, are you familiar? He's retired now. Or, um, uh, and then Robin, I'm trying to think of the name of her shop. She recently moved, but Robin Dunkel has a shop there across from the Berean Post Office. Um, anyways, let, there's these legendary Berean stories. The Be old Berianites will tell you that Hart used to rehearse in this little tiny space across from the Seahurst Post Office. Wow. And, the you know, they share a parking lot with the Bean there. And um, so... Uh, Kathy Anderson, who's a three tree point resident here. A lot of people know, um, I took her to this show with Ann Wilson and I, because her, um, her, uh, I believe it's her uncle used to manage heart. And so that's not why I took her to the show. It's coincidental, but I took her backstage and, um, Ann actually recognized her. And um, from being a little kid, you know, working because he had her working with her and um, her hu Kathy's husband, Todd, asked, and, you know, uh, you guys used to rehearse in Berean at this place. And, uh, you know, everyone's been talking about it ever since the 80s, you know, and uh, can you tell me anything about that? And Ann said, where's Berean? <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> I think if her memory was jogged a little better, she'd remember, but I, th you know, so many world tours and all of that stuff, I thought, you know, um, but maybe that's, uh, something I could help do is figure some of that stuff out with the other people I know with heart, because a lot of people ask about that, or they talk about this famous rehearsals in Berean. So Lily, I think that if you ever have, I know all of us, don't have the time. All of us struggle with it. But if it is something that is accessible to you and it's something that you enjoy doing, I think people all are not just for this generation, but in future generations to be able to save them in our collections, to be able to preserve those stories. I mean, that is the mission of the museum is it, it goes beyond this generation is like what is coming and then being able to record that. I think it's so basic and, 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 and essential and as to what what is shaping the community and, and music absolutely is one of those areas factors that unite us all and then also share a lot had those that it has the element of being able to share a lot of um what makes us us, us as a human beings be able to dance be able to sing be able to play together be able to have this wonderful gathering and so i think that being able to record the history of musicians in Berean the, those stories that, you know, you know, it may be, we don't know for sure we can prove it, but at least we can save them. And then maybe through research or through archives or whatever, we can find out whether or not those stories were true, but at least to be able to start collecting them will be something that will be so essential for, for, for us and for anyone after us. So yes, if you got more stories, please, uh, we can do I don't know, you can do a, a quick diary or you can do uh, digitally type in emails to me. Oh, I just remember this. So I talked to this person and it would just start collecting yeah. emails or something like that. 
Um, so with all these people that you know and all the celebrities that you have interacted with, I hope that you um, connected with them in a, in a level that is encouraging your passion. You know, it's not to me, music is not just about who's celebrity, who's not. It's more about how do you express and how do we feel what you're expressing? Um, it could be all kinds of emotions. I've seen a lot of videos out there where, you know, you have all these famous musicians doing these experiments that they will be playing with, with these beautiful venues, but then just for the fun of it, the day before or the day after, they will go up to the subway and play and kind of hide their, their, their looks a little bit, but just play and nobody pays attention to them. No, uh -huh. Nobody actually listens to them. While the night before, the day after, that's when they actually charge more than $1,000 just to, you know, per, per, see them perform. And yeah. so the idea of celebrities and titles and, you know, how you project to the people is one thing. But they, um, I would like to tap more into the passion and the magic and, and, and how we all express each other. And like for you, do you uh, write your own music? I know that part of your bio kind of shows a little bit on you writing your music, but how frequently do you do that? And then if this is something that uh, that we got, the Vika let us know where we can find more about the materials that you call work. So Absolutely. Yeah, I, I do write a lot of music. Um, I have, I, I want to say five or six, um, CDs, uh, one vinyl record um, under my own name called uh, Postpone Parade, which is the most recent uh, in 2020. And it was, um, uh, I was awarded uh, best, best jazz group of, or best alternative jazz group, I believe it was called, of 2020 Earshot Jazz Magazine um, through doing this recording, um, which was done all right here in my basement where I'm sitting right now, I did all the um, keyboard and bass parts. And then I would do kind of a scratch track and then send it to a drummer, Max Holmberg or um, Matt Jorgensen's the other drummer that I know knew at the time that could uh, work virtually. <laughs> and then um, overall, I used about 12 musicians on that recording. Um, but it was all just stuff I would just write what how do I feel at that moment I didn't think about I want it to be uh jazzy or I, any category or anything like that so it turned out pretty eclectic um but uh that that kind of writing very creative uh I love to do and I've kind of taken a sidetrack since because I got into writing some music for film and sync music so um i've written over a hundred tracks um in the last uh two or three years just for sync music purposes so uh which what will see the light of day is maybe 10 percent of those hopefully you know so in that world so it's a little bit of an underground thing for me right now but i would love to get back to doing some more um albums and and that kind of a thing i musicians to me they're an artist and you use that term very frequently you're an artist in creating your own your own expression and um and there's something you know there's a few elements in in, in a society everyday society that allows us to connect to each other and one of them is through music and and that is universal you can go any part of the globe any part of the country you don't even have to speak the same language and you can still resonate to what you're listening to you can still connect with it uh you can still dance you can still connect an emotional element inside of you either you're sad you're joyful you 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 know you just want to calm or you just want to go with the flow um one of the things that i'm trying my best not to inject my personal things into the interviews but this one i think i am going to uh I used hearing aids. I was not able to hear for the first eight years of my life. And so the way I experienced music was through touching the sound, um, the speaker phones, the speakers, the oh, vibrations. Wow. And so I will I will just get close to the speakers and I just let um all the nerves in my on my fingertips just touch the 
the speakers and just feel the vibration. The lighter that I was on it, the more vibration I was feeling it. You know, if you like car, car on, touching the speakers, you don't feel it as, I mean, you feel it. But it's almost like when it's like, just like you know, like when you have this gentle touch, it's the same thing. Wow. And then so you just let the vibrations travel through your fingertips. And that's how I was able to experience music for the first time in my life. And then after that, I started to dance, just touching it. And then after that, when I was actually be able to hear, um, it was even better because I, I was able to hear things that I was not able to capture through just the vibrations. And so even though I was, I'm 80% deaf, I love music. I cannot be one day without music. I have to somehow connect to it. Uh, like I say, either in a good day, a bad day, a sad day, a joyful day. Um, and so, no, I... I love, I love that you're able to express yourself through many different instruments, through many different uh, formats. And then there is a big feel of music. I just, you just share, um, you know, all the way from playing with, uh, with musicians around you, but then also celebrities. And then now writing your own music. Um, do you have, what is, what's coming after this? Are you going to, I know that you already share what you like to go back to, but is any uh, cool yeah. projects are coming? It is anything else that, that is calling your attention that you want to experiment with or what's coming? What's, what's next? Oh, well, next for me. Uh, well, first of all, thanks for sharing your story. Um, yeah, if you don't mind, I wouldn't mind before I tell you what's next. <laughs> uh, I, that I had two experiences, um, that really changed my life um, that has to do with uh, what you're talking about, um, where one, I played, at, I played at this place called Barb's Soul Food in Olympia. And the, it's fa totally family owned. They're not there anymore, but um, family owned. Like I, if I didn't finish my chicken and the guy said, you know, I can't bring this back to my mom. She's, you know, she's going to, yell at me can you just finish it <laughs> so i finished it and uh uh his sister was um you know bus tables and and worked around the restaurant she was 100 percent deaf and i played a little uh piano um it was a upright piano there she didn't come up and touch the piano but uh her brother came up between sets and he was shaking and he said that uh um, my sister heard you. And I thought, what, you know, um, so somehow she heard me or my music came through to her and she was a hundred percent deaf. And so that really, uh, says something. And I had a, another experience, uh, like you were saying, where you're touching, like touching the piano. Um, I was at a home where, uh, this person was completely deaf and blind and then moving to the vibrations of the piano. And uh, both of those experiences just really touched me a lot. Um, just the power of music, you know. And it's a very strong one. And that's probably why I'm sharing it, because it is such a, a real emotion that comes through you. Um, when you hear, you, you, you hear the the cars and baby crying and and all these everyday sounds that you really don't want to hear. And so when you actually hear something is beautiful and meaningful and personal, is it, it takes you to a different place. And so for me to be able to maybe not hear everyday sounds, but to experience an emotion through my fingertips is something that is powerful. Um, even after to the this day, I still, when I don't want to hear anything, I just turn up my hearing. It's like, no, I'm just not going to hear anything. I just turn them off. Yeah. But yeah. the idea of, of like turning them off and then maybe touching a speaker on, you know, when if it's just, in a, and when I'm alone in the room and I just want it to be calm and nice, it is wow. really soothing. Um, I know that, that like in my case, I'm very emotional. I'm very sensitive for the same reason because I'm open myself. I'm open about the senses. I'm I'm not just in my brain hearing it and processing it. And that said to me is I'm letting I'm letting everything hit me because I'm I'm opening myself to receive those sensations. And so I don't know. I I love when I'm in 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 
in a performance place and you can feel the vibration throughout the whole, the whole, you know, like on the space, you can feel all, I could be acoustic ceiling or it could be something that it resonates throughout the room, but, and then you turn around and you got not only one or two or three people, but a lot of people connected to it at the same time. I don't know. I do really believe it's a powerful experience to, to connect through music. I do believe that um, it, it touches us. I mean, think about it when you have a baby crying, you hold a baby and then you just sing a lullaby, that right away comes comes the baby. Right away makes him feel that comfort and, and that soothness. Uh, if you have a really bad day and you want to shake it off and just like, let's turn on the music, let's just have fun and go wild and then just, just moving and rocking and it really can turn your day um, upside down with the music. Um, depression, for example. If you're depressed and then you go into dark music, it can really sink you even deeper. And mm. so there's one of those those tools that can really go all the way up and down and left and right. And um, but yeah, at the end of the day, it's a human experience. And, and I'm just glad that that you had the passion for it and that you share that with everyone around you. And then hopefully you can continue to share more uh, of what you got inside and how you express in the, that passion through either the classes or the new projects and just, just playing any regular project, I mean, uh, instrument. So thank you for that. Thank you. Okay. So now let's go back to um, what's next. What, right. What's coming up? Hey. Next? Well, yeah. So, uh, well, tomorrow, or yeah, tomorrow I'm heading to LA um to uh, this taxi it's a outfit called taxi they're the largest a and r in the world um for getting f placements film for film tv record labels and all of that um and i've been working on that for about three years so i'm just looking to further that I i've had so far i've had eight placements on the young and the restless <laughs> of all things, uh, soap opera. So, um, you know, I have a bunch of other things kind of floating out there and hopeful to uh, get on TV or film or somewhere and to just kind of branch out um, and get what they call mail money because I'm the older I get, I would like to get some uh, when I can't uh, stand up on the stage anymore. Maybe I'll have some money rolling in <laughs> from stuff I did in the past. That's the only way to do it. So uh, the music industry, you have to wear a lot of hats. So, you know, I'm teaching five days a week and continue to do that. Um, and then playing a lot of shows. Uh, I appeared on Duff McKagan's most recent album that came out last week and uh, very excited about that because he's kind of a hero of mine and uh, uh, he's the bass player for Guns N' Roses and um, that uh, there might be some tour dates with that I don't know if he'll ask me to do it because I don't sing backup vocals but <laughs> you know, <laughs> which happens a lot in that world but uh I've tried to fake it till I make it and I just can't fake it enough. <laughs> yeah. The what is your favorite instrument of, of everything that, that, that you've been playing so far? What what is your favorite area to go to? Well, it kind of depends on the on the day. Um I, I guess I'm most adept at the piano. Um and it's many offshoots, organ and I really like the analog keyboards because they have a real feel to it. Um that you can't get from the digital uh something that you can it's more felt than heard mm -hmm. um anything analog keyboard wise but yeah i just sometimes i'll just go on a big kick where i just want to play bass or i just want to play guitar um and uh i'm kind of on a guitar kick right now i don't have any gigs on guitar per se but doing some recording with it and playing around with it nice Nice. Uh, talking about like something that you punch and 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 play with and and really go in. It reminds me of um, we do have an exhibit here at the museum. It's all about typewriters. And since the day one, I've seen how kids react to that typewriters because on on the lower area you can actually go in and actually touch and then use it. And 
And I was like, why aren't the kids reacting to it? And then every time I have done a field trip, kids just go in lines just to have a little shot and touching the typewriter. Like, why is it the kids are reacting to this so powerful, so so strongly? And then later it hit to me that kids are growing up with tablets and cell phones and smartphones and and TVs that are at two dimensional, they're flat screens. And so something about being able to grab something and punch, something to actually connect and make a sound and connect and, and communicate something. And I think we underestimating the need uh, on our young ones to actually experience that. All of us grew up with, you know, no digital toys. We grew up with actual toys that we can play and destroy and have accidents with. But these kids are not growing up with that. And I think that playing an instrument, uh, it can replace that. Maybe not a toy toy, but it uh, can replace that need for us to communicate and punch and kick and make do something mechanical to it. I mean, I'm very impressed by the number of kids that, ha- that are just completely glued to the typewriters. And I know that they, they, there is something instinctually that we need that. We need that punching and I'm looking at the equipment, the radio equipment, and part of me wants to play with everything in here. I mean, I, I wish people can see what's in front of me and it's just like a lot of buttons and things like I'm playing. T- yeah. Taking all that. <laughs> yeah. But um, like you hope that uh, parents, if you're listening out there, pay attention to your kids as to how they might need that uh, or they might have that crave of punching and touching and experience something that that they communicate tactile, not digitally. And so you you come and remind me of how, how much of that is taking place here at the museum. So thank you for sharing that. You um, bet. Yeah. yeah, Woody Allen still uses a regular typewriter today to write his screenplays and all of that because it's just so tactile. It's just there's something different about it than a laptop or what have you. Absolutely. I think that especially when, I don't know, I grow Growing up, I did not like the typewriters as much. I just hated those mistakes. And I made mistakes every single five seconds, I think. And it's like, ah, I had to restart the whole thing, you know, even though oh, you no. had that yeah. and everything. It's like, man, uh, <laughs> now, nowadays, I mean, even texting and, 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 and then using your phone and social media, sometimes I go back to it like, oh, man, look at the bad spelling that I did or whatever. So I, it is something cool about using uh, original communication tools um, all the way from like recently I had the experience with a camera a, a photographer who was taking photos but with really camera no digital they were using real black and white film um, and it was a camera from 1950s like oh my god how oh, cool, cool that, is. that is so so cool and so I think all of us have a little bit of that inside of us that we do like uh, the mechanical items instead of that digital we enjoy the uh, how convenient the digital platforms are, but I think we also instinctually need that that the tactile experience, and I do hope that people can experience that through playing an instrument. I like a uh, guitar. I'm not good at it. I used to learn a little bit how to play that, and the sensation is beautiful. But I don't want to talk about me. I want to talk about you. So this is about you, and not the <laughs> museum. And so, well, I love that subject. Yeah, um, and yeah. That somebody. Um, uh, well. I- at Berkeley School of Music, my technology, music technology teacher kind of explained uh, why vinyl is better than uh, CDs. But CDs were kind of just coming out back then. <laughs> I mean, not really, uh, they had been out for a few years, but uh, analog versus digital. And there is a, there's a logical explanation for that is that um, on a CD or an MP3, um, you know, different files, there's a certain, um, it can only go to so many Hertz to the low end and the high end, uh, without getting too technical. So then these are hurt. These are some things that the human ear supposedly can't hear, but you miss it when it's not there. Hmm. So, you know, especially if you listen to Spotify, you know, they compress the music to make the files smaller, to fit more, and it loses something. But if you play a record, an analog vinyl record or a cassette tape, there is no uh, limit to the amount of hertz up or, you know, everything's there. That's why, including the tape hiss, the crackles, whatever it is, but um, it, it, 
you can feel it, maybe not hear it. I think I hear it, but you know, uh, but you can definitely feel it when it's gone. So if you compare back to back. Now you made me very intrigued and curious because I don't hear a lot. I miss even with my hearing is I'm not hundred percent there. I'm still struggling with that. But maybe feeling something is what also gets my maybe that's what it is. Maybe it's not something that humans are registering, but it's something that an element that um is present but is not visually clear. Mm, now you open yeah. you 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 letting me go into this era or this phase of Am I no, maybe no knowing what it is, but I might be can able to identify the missing sound. And then that's why some music I'm not so into it. And some music like, whoa, I don't know what it is, but it just feels amazing. Um, gosh, I'm going to research more of that. So thank you for, <laughs> for finding that out. Um, well, just put, if you have a record player, do you have a record player or a, a access to one? If you find, just go to uh a streaming service, play the track and then play the record and see if you feel differently about it. Yeah. Yeah. You and know? then also the, um, you know, it's like playing live music versus a recorded music. You can, you see, you feel the difference between being on site and actually feeling the vibrations versus uh, listening on your own. Even if you have a high, all, all the speakers all the way up, you can still feel the difference between live and, and, and uh, recorded. And I'm going to play the experiment. Um, I don't like to play with uh, cassettes only because I guess of the many years of training on how delicate those are that in now nowadays, because when you think about time, this is a time where all the cassettes that you replay, they're going to break. They, there's, uh, there is an expiration dates on those type of things, all films and tapes and even the CDs. Now we already, a lot of the things are getting expired. And mm -hmm. so the, um, when I go to cassettes, I'm very, very anxious. I don't like to play them just because I know that I should be expecting to the tape to break at any given Might time. be the last time, yeah. <laughs> I know, I know, and especially with collections. So one thing that we did is that we actually contracted a service to digitize our tape collections. It was all our histories. And that way, and they also promised that if anything was broken, that they will fix it. They will fix the tape back again. I was like, okay. Yeah, I prefer a professional dealing with that. But now, like, I have so many tapes at home, and it's like, oh, I wish I can play with them. But I, I feel that I've played them, and then there will be, I will break them. <laughs> um, the technology, now that we're talking about technology, you used to play instruments before the digital era. Um, how How do you feel about this, you know, how we use things digitally? I know that we already had the conversation of how um, the experience is different when it's, it's analog and, and it's mechanical. Um, in your future, do you see going back to your roots of getting more into the analog and the more of that, you know, getting away from digi digital components? I just have, I'm afraid that as time passes, technology is going to get crazier and crazier and crazier. And I feel that it's going to be pushing us in a direction of walking away from from actually using instruments i've seen a lot of musicians that they will produce a song from the computer with a lot of instruments from the computer instead of using real instruments how you feel about that yes i well yeah I, the ai is the thing now um and so with the like with the music that i'm working on for film you know there's a computer that can generate the music for a scene, you know, um, that uh, is kind of threatening to replace humans. And, <laughs> you know, if you're um, that's being overly paranoid, I think. But I, I think that people will always connect to um, real instruments. And uh, I try and use them when when I can, I, I try and use the real instrument. You know, they make things easier uh, with plugins so I can duplicate a piano via MIDI. Um, there's advantages to that if you're working on a timeline and a library says, well, we want this uh, eight clicks faster or we want that to be a road sound instead of a piano sound. You wouldn't have to go back and re-record it. You could just go into the computer, make it faster, do, you know, but um, I've actually had to go back in the studio 
hire musicians, record it, eight clicks faster, pay the drummer, pay the bass player, and then have it approved again, you know? So it might not, it's not financially viable sometimes to do that. Uh, and I learned my lesson that way. So um, it just depends on the situation, but I try and I always try and use the real deal if I can. Yeah. Well, thank you for that feedback. Uh, I think I perspectives, right? I mean, I see what's behind you, you see behind me, and then you also have different experiences. And and I never thought about the cost of making money. I mean, the cost of making music. And so that's an element that is completely out of my my mind. Well, we uh, are almost at the end of our interview. And okay. so we only have a few more minutes. Would you like to share the last comment, last story, something? Um, well, I get well, one, one thing I was trying to find the name of the, the building where Hart used to rehearse and, uh, my friend Dusty just texted me. It's called Howard and Marge. Okay. And okay. it's now, it's now, uh, further down 152nd, but, okay. um, just to clarify that, um, no, not really just, I guess, um, uh, um, early playing experiences, uh, I would, was going to mention this band, Not Tonight, which um, Andy Kleitch, you might know Andy Kleitch from, he's a three tree pointer as well, but um, he has a business called Atamo, which is a beanless coffee. He was the lead singer. He still does music today. Um, and uh, in a, the Kier cover band and on the side. Um, but we, uh, we played the Water, Waterland Festival in Des Moines back in the day and um i thought it's just worth mentioning getting my start playing in bands that was my first real band that i ever played in so um uh, and also my friend zach hoppenrath has the zach static sect and he's uh also active Burian resident still playing around um and um i guess shout outs to them and dusty dunkel <laughs> I just love to see my friends uh, in the area still playing around Chris Crumpler with Roman and the whereabouts. They played at the um, UFO festival mm -hmm. there, um, which you took part in. Um, so yeah, I guess I'll use my last minutes for those little shout outs there. <laughs> no, this is great. I think the way to begin is to celebrate our community and celebrate each other and being able to say, Hey, we're here. And then, um, I, I hope that I had opportunity to to give an interview or to have an interview with them because it will be kind of cool. And then I hope yeah. that we continue to engage um, in the work that we do in serving our community and just super happy and thankful that you were here today with us. Uh, music, I'm just continue to do that. We human beings need that in our lives and we do need to connect with each other that way too. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank and you. We'll connect soon. Thank All you. Right, thanks, Nancy. Okay. Bye, everyone. Our Highline Voices, 106.5 KQWZ LP FM. We envision ourselves sitting at a round table where no one is the leader and stories are heard respectfully, regardless of gender, age, sexual orientation, disabilities, or ethnicity. We want to embrace our differences and similarities. We are creating a place where visitors can connect with the stories and each other. Our mission is we collect, preserve, and tell the stories of the Highline region and its people. We want to extend our mission outside the walls of the museum. Our Highline Voices represents us all, honoring our past, celebrating our present, and uniting to cultivate our future. This project allows us to reach out to demographics who might be unable to visit the museum. People with disabilities, low-income families, people who don't trust museums, and more. In partnership, we are launching a locally programmed new radio station at the museum featuring recorded and live Highline's heritage, history, culture, arts, and more. Are you interested in sharing your story? Email director at highlinemuseum.org. <laughs>